Good morning and welcome to the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario's virtual press conference. Before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to ask the media interested in asking questions to please indicate so in the Zoom by adding a comment in the Q&A section, which you'll find at the bottom of the screen. Please include only your first and last name and the media outlet you are with. If you experience technical issues throughout the Zoom conference, please use the chat to communicate with ETFO staff. Now I'd like to introduce the individuals joining us this morning. Sam Hammond, President of the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. Harvey Bischoff, President of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. Colin Furness, Epidemiologist and Assistant Professor in the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto. Shamila Shaquille, a York Region parent representing Ontario families for public education. Romana Siddiqui, a Peel Region parent representing Ontario Parent Action Network. Liz Stewart, President of the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association. Anne Vinay Roy, President of the Association des Enseignants et des Enseignants franco ontariennes And Laura Walton, President of CUPE's Ontario School Board Council of Unions. Sam, please begin. Yeah, thank you, uh, Carla, and good morning, everyone. On behalf of uh, ETFO and our 83,000 members, I'd like to thank you for being with us today to discuss school safety and the immediate need to vaccinate all education workers. You know, Ontario is now in a third wave of a pandemic that is driven by more infectious var variants and a provincial government that has prioritized economic activity and appeasing businesses' interests over the need to protect the health of Ontarians. And the result has been disastrous. Given the deeply concerning rise in COVID-19 cases in areas across Ontario, and the government's negligent decision to keep schools open without additional enhanced safety measures, education workers and all essential workers must be prioritized for vaccinations now, not later. Until we can get answers on this, immediate steps must be taken to ensure the safety of education workers and students in hotspot areas, including a temporary move from in-person to virtual learning. You know, given our history with Premier Ford and Minister Lecce, we can't wait for them to start listening to experts and implement the necessary measures. And this is why ETFO has asked public health units to both prioritize education workers and other essential workers for access to the COVID-19 vaccine. And where necessary, to temporarily shut down in-person learning to protect everyone in our schools across the province. I want to acknowledge and thank the public health units who have taken this action. Toronto and Peel are examples. And their cautious, responsible approach to ensuring public safety, safety in our schools is so very much appreciated. And I also want to acknowledge that virtual learning can be and is challenging for families, students, and educators. And we strongly and have always believed that quality in-person learning, when done safely, is what is best and most equitable for all students. Unfortunately, Due to the Ford government's repeated refusal to make the necessary inf investments, their refusal to reduce class sizes and increase physical distancing, for example, in our classrooms, this is not possible in many areas of the province because it is simply unsafe. Just yesterday, Premier Ford tried yet again to make the case that schools are safe. He quoted statistics to make it sound like we don't have anything to worry about. But simple math tells us that those provincial averages do not accurately reflect what is happening on the ground in schools in hotspots like Peel, Toronto, York, Greater Essex, Hamilton, and Ottawa. More than one in four schools in the province currently have active COVID cases. And the incident of cases in schools is likely much higher. But because the government has failed to provide sufficient access to asymptomatic testing, we simply don't know to what extent. 
When medical officers of health are urging the government to implement province-wide stay-at-home orders and calling on them to strengthen public health measures, schools are not safe places to learn and work. Medical experts have repeatedly said that schools are not reflections of community transmission, but drivers of it, and that variants are being transmitted by children. And we see this clear, clearly in the distressing rise of COVID-19 cases in schools across this province. By downplaying the transmission of COVID-19 in schools and refusing to provide the necessary funding and critically in, critical enhanced safety protocols, the Ford government continues to prove that they are incapable of managing the pandemic and keeping everyone in this province and in our schools safe. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the Ford government has prioritized cost cutting and the economy over the safety and well-being of students and education workers. And this should anger everyone. As medical experts have said, there is no excuse, no valid reason to not begin vaccinating all essential workers today, given the numbers of vaccines that are sitting in freezers. If, if, if everything, as, as they say, is truly on the table, the government will and must find a way to ensure education workers have access to the COVID-19 vaccine at the same time as other vulnerable populations so that they can be vaccinated before the end of the April break next week, especially in the hardest hit regions. I wanna know from the Premier and Minister uh, Lecce today, when exactly will educators and other essential workers be vaccinated? Provide us with a date. Stop deflecting and deferring. You're playing with the lives of everyone in this province. It's time for you to step up, be specific and act. Vaccinations for educators can't wait until May or June. They need to happen now and next week while schools are closed. Thanks very much. And I'd now like to introduce Liz Stewart, President of the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association. Liz? Thank you, Sam. The Ford government's insistence that schools are somehow immune to the spread of COVID-19 is downright dangerous. It goes against all available evidence about the role schools are playing in the transmission of COVID-19, particularly in this third wave. Essentially, in a bid to restrain spending and avoid admitting they failed to do enough to date, Premier Ford and Minister Lecce are prepared to gamble with the lives of teachers, education workers, students, families, and all Ontarians. Like many others in the education community, our association has been trying for more than a year to work with the Ford government on a plan for safer schools. We've echoed the calls from medical experts for stronger health and safety measures in schools, including smaller class sizes to facilitate physical distancing, better ventilation and widespread testing. But the government has resisted us at every turn. And while Premier Ford and Minister Lecce have repeatedly promised that more robust protocols are on the way, they have consistently failed to follow through. This is why our association has joined with others to call on the Ford government and local public health units to immediately prioritize the vaccination of teachers, education workers, and other essential workers, particularly in hotspot public health units, and to move schools in these regions from in-person to virtual learning. The benefits of in-person learning are clear. This is precisely why the education community is so thoroughly opposed to the Ford government's plan to make virtual learning the new normal post-pandemic. But the bottom line is that under proper health and safety, until proper health and safety measures are in place, including vaccination of teacher and education workers, it's simply not safe for schools to remain open, especially in hotspot regions. Teachers are doing everything we can to help students and families navigate these challenging times, but with evidence mounting about the role schools play in the transmission of COVID-19, it's more important than ever that the Ford government finally get their act together and do their part to protect our school communities. It's time for Ontarians to say enough is enough. 
I'd now like to introduce Harvey Bisher, president of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. Harvey. Thank you, Liz. It's been clear for some time that the Ford government is driven by an ideological agenda. It's not one they campaigned on or have even admitted, but it's been revealed through their actions. We'd already seen their willingness to sacrifice high quality education at the altar of fiscal austerity. Now we're seeing them gambling health, well-being and potentially rather than implement the necessary measures to keep students, educators and their families safe. What we are also truly seeing in Ontario's school system right now is the fallout of Minister Lecce continuing to rest his political ambitions on the fiction that schools are safe from COVID spread. The recent words and actions of health experts tell us otherwise. As just one example, a few days ago, Dr. Abdu Sharkawi was quoted saying, this myth that somehow schools are immune to being able to transmit, transmit the virus, it's got to end. We agree. Yesterday, Toronto Public Health announced the closure of all schools in the region. Two days ago, Peel and Wellington Dufferin Guelph Public Health made similar announcements. We continue to have Northern Ontario jurisdictions closed to in-person learning. It's clearly well past time that the provincial government moved to remote learning in hotspot areas until educators are vaccinated and the vaccines have taken effect. The pandemic continues to be addressed as if it were a political game for this Conservative government but that comes with serious consequences. How can the same minister tout online learning as the ideal instructional model, one which he wants to make permanent, but refuse to use it now as a tool to help keep our communities safe? There have been numerous opportunities to implement appropriate safety measures in our schools and our communities. Those opportunities have been squandered by Ford and his government. Improvements to ventilation should have begun in a serious way in the summer. A robust asymptomatic testing regime should have been created when this government was first advised to do so before schools reopened in September. I won't detail all the measures that should have been taken, but it is clear that over and over again, this government chose to shortchange education, shortchange students and educators, and shortchange Ontario's economic recovery. In the longer term, there will be serious detrimental consequences for this short-sightedness. I'd like now to introduce Anne Venewa, president of the Association des Enseignants et des Enseignants Franco-Ontariennes. Anne. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, some of my comments will obviously be in French and English as well. Nous savons très bien que l'enseignement en personne est fondamental pour le succès des élèves et qu'un retour temporaire à un mode d'apprentissage à distance n'est pas l'idéal pour l'ensemble de la communauté scolaire, incluant nos membres. Mais il faut absolument affronter cette troisième vague de contamination de manière efficace et préventive en ce qui a trait à sa présence dans nos lieux de travail scolaire. Pour contrer la propagation de la COVID-19 et ses variants dans les lieux de travail des zones d'exposition les plus à risque, nous sommes d'avis, comme nos collègues, que le gouvernement doit agir rapidement et fermer temporairement les écoles, surtout dans les zones plus à risque. If schools were to remain open, the government would have to act in a meaningful way with real measures to protect the whole school community, including students and their families. But no matter what the government has been saying, that is absolutely not what is being done. Many of our members still have to deal with poor quality PPEs, overcrowded classrooms with poor ventilation, and unrealistic expectations of what can reasonably be accomplished teaching and learning wise in these unprecedented times. We have had many indications in the past months that this government is way more concerned with money than the health and well-being of our school communities. Nos membres et la communauté scolaire entière vont bien au-delà de leurs responsabilités respectives pour se protéger et protéger les élèves. Mais sans un engagement et un appui véritable du gouvernement, les lacunes en matière de sécurité dans les écoles vont perdurer. Le niveau élevé de propagation du virus dans certaines communautés L'absence de mesures de sécurité supplémentaires pour contrer les nouveaux variants plus agressifs de la COVID-19, des classes surpeuplées et mal ventilées dans un trop grand nombre d'endroits, le manque de règles adéquates de distanciation physique et les lacunes concernant les tests de dépistage pour personnes asymptomatiques, entre autres, continuent de mettre à risque les élèves et le personnel. No school-related workplace is immune from this virus and its variants. The government must stop pretending 
that everything is okay in our school communities by saying that close to 99% of schools have no COVID cases. If you look at the charts for cases in all schools across the province, you will see that it is actually rather close to 25% of schools that are affected. That 99% of schools the government keeps using is based on the little amount of asymptomatic testing that is being done province-wide and not on the actual overall situation. The government keeps trying to convince itself and others that it is doing everything right and that if things are not going well, it is because of the people of Ontario not following rules. It is everybody else's fault but their own. Enough with the lies. Aucun lieu de travail n'est à l'épreuve de la contamination. Le gouvernement doit faire sa part pour protéger les communautés scolaires et cesser de blâmer la population en général quand la crise sanitaire à laquelle nous devons toutes et tous faire face s'aggrave. Assez, c'est assez. L'approche réactionnaire du gouvernement Ford ne fonctionne pas. Il faut dès maintenant une approche préventive en procédant par exemple le plus rapidement possible à la vaccination des travailleurs et des travailleuses de première ligne qui veulent être immunisés contre la COVID-19. L'AFO demande donc, comme tous nos collègues syndicaux, au gouvernement d'agir maintenant pour contrer la propagation de la COVID-19 dans les écoles des zones d'exposition les plus à risque. I would now like to introduce our colleague Laura Walton, President of QP's Ontario School Board Council of Unions. Laura. Merci, Anne. A year on from the first lockdown of this pandemic, education workers know that their safety in schools has never been a priority for this government. And this neglect puts students at risk too. For months, QP education workers have called on the Ministry of Education to put measures in place to keep everyone safe in school. Yet there's been no action on a provincial cleaning standard, no action on smaller cohorts that include the workers in the classroom so that workers like educational assistants don't have to move from class to class to class. We've asked for a minimum of air purifiers in every room that is occupied in a school, especially in those schools where outdated HVAC systems or they have windows that don't open. We've asked for enhanced active screening of everyone before they enter into schools. We wanna see classes and cohorts dismissed when there is even one case of COVID identified or when close contacts of a case are identified. We've asked for enhanced PPE for educational assistants, designate, designated early childhood educators, and everyone who routinely works in close contact with students who are unable to mask. And we want education workers included among those who are prioritized for vaccination in the current phase of immunizations in Ontario. Education workers have caught COVID on the job in Ontario schools. Unfortunately, we have already lost members to COVID. We are on the front lines in our schools. Our provincial government should be listening to the voices and demands of education workers who continue to provide the public education that our children, our families, and our communities depend on. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I'd now like to introduce Colin Furness, epidemiologist and assistant professor in the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto. Colin. Good morning and thank you. As an infection control epidemiologist, my position on all this is that we simply do not understand transmission in schools. Globally, we agree that kids get infected. Globally, we agree that kids spread it. It seems for the most part that kids that say under the age of about 10 spread it less than adults do, although the recent emergence of variants of concern may actually challenge that understanding as well. We also agree that transmission of COVID happens when people share air for prolonged periods of time. When you have a large number of people sitting in a room all day long, and yes, that describes schools, you've got a lot of risk. The global evidence is contradictory, there's no question. And I have heard people cherry pick studies on both sides to say that schools are safe and schools are dangerous. Measurement is very difficult, partly because as we know, kids tend to manifest asymptomatically. But kids may also get transient infections, not easily detected, yet contagious. Kids may actually experience COVID in different waves that are timed differently than adults, the concept of child prevalence. That makes measurement even more difficult to do. But one thing we can see very clearly is that when we look for cases, we will find them. Now, in early February, the province announced a, a regime of testing 2% of kids uh, every single week. 
Um, that's inadequate. No question that was absolutely inadequate. It looked to me at the time that it was designed to generate talking points rather than safety. But the reality has not been 2% of kids every single week, inadequate as that, be, as that would be. It has apparently been more like 1% in total over a two-month period. Mr. Lecce, who we do not expect to be an epidemiologist or to be skilled in, in understanding communicable disease, has reported a positivity rate of 0.56%. That does seem very low. But I want to be very clear that a small proportion of a very large number is still a very large number. Comparing proportions is on the elementary school curriculum. If we've got 3 million kids in Ontario, a positivity rate of 0.56 suggests that we've got 15,000 undiagnosed child cases in schools. How can that possibly be safe? Even if many, even if most aren't involved in transmission, some will be. But I'd like to suggest that the number could be a lot higher than 15,000. I say could because, again, we don't know. But when we look at how testing has been done with this 1%, it's not systematic, it's not random, it's not representative, it's a cattle call. Now we know from experience that folks who are most at risk, folks who are families who are marginalized, who are in many cases racialized, aren't necessarily the ones who are gonna come forward. It may well be kids and families come forward because they're most concerned, not necessarily because they're most at risk. So the case levels could actually be a lot higher. There's going to be some transmission of cases in schools and also in families. What we're finding with the contagious variant in Ontario is, is entire families getting infected when one uh, family member gets infected. If we, put the, if we put people in a building and we, and, we, and we put a sign on top that says school, the transmission dynamics aren't going to necessarily be all that much different. So I would like to see a couple of things. I would like to see universal testing in schools, universal rapid testing. We could do this, we just have to decide to do it. And it does not need to be the nasopharyngeal, extremely uncomfortable swab. We don't need to make our kids uncomfortable. I've never met a kid who wouldn't spit in a cup. I mean, that sounds like a fun activity, I think, at a certain age. We can, do rat, we can do swabbing in the front of the nose. So we don't need to make this traumatizing. If we did this systematically, we would find thousands of cases. That would lead us to thousands of infected families. That would lead us to control of transmission. In other words, emphasizing safe schools can also result in safe communities. There's a long history of public health doing good work in schools. And I propose that we should continue that long, very, very useful history. In addition to universal testing, of course, I want to see teachers vaccinated. I want to see, of course, all essential workers vaccinated. We can argue perhaps about the order in which essential workers should be prioritized, but those who work indoors and have sustained prolonged contact with others should absolutely be prioritized. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin. I'd now like to introduce Shamila Shaquille, a York Region parent who's here representing Ontario Families for Public Education. Shamila? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. We knew this third wave was coming. The science table experts told us so. And now we have variants of concern in play. Even with the current health and safety measures in place, transmission and exposures are happening in schools, resulting in increases in 14-day isolations, outbreaks, and closures. In a few cases, unfortunately, the result has been hospitalizations. In-person learning is optimal when schools are safe. However, schools are congregate settings where it is impossible to maintain the two meters of physical distancing recommended, especially in elementary schools where kids eat lunch together every day. With such high levels of community transmission, a huge spike in school cases in the past two weeks, the resulting staff requirements to isolate at home and supply staff reluctant to enter schools with cases, we are at a point where schools are closing, school boards are closing schools and pivoting to remote learning. I've seen it a lot in York Region schools recently. Thus, it makes sense to prioritize the vaccination of all education workers, the same way that the province prioritized healthcare workers' vaccinations to keep our hospitals running, they must prioritize education workers' vaccinations to keep our schools running. We have seen a list of regions with school closures, mainly in Ontario's current hotspots. The reality is that medical officers of health should not have had to resort to Section 22 orders. What we have witnessed over the past few days is a reflection of poor decision-making and inaction by the provincial government. We have also seen a short list of two regions that moved education workers up the priority list for immediate vaccines. We applaud this decision. Unfortunately, York Region is not on either of these lists, but it should be. 
As co-chair of York Communities for Public Education and an administrator of a Facebook group with thousands of York Region parents and educators, I'm channeling the frustrations and energy of many here with a specific message for our Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Kurji. If he, Premier Ford, and Minister Lecce want our schools to be the heart of the community and to be the first to open and last to close, then our teachers and all school staff should be amongst the first to get vaccinated. Waiting until May to vaccinate all essential workers will lead to a higher number of COVID-19 cases in our communities and consequently in our schools. The impact on families' physical and mental health is alarming. Many education workers, factory workers, and grocery store workers are scared, and they should be. Medical experts and healthcare workers have confirmed that the variants of concern present us with a very different battle now, and we need to show courage and to do what's ethical. This means vaccinating all of our essential workers in an equitable manner, especially those living and working in hotspot areas. This also means covering paid sick days so workers will stay home without worrying about paying bills and putting food on their families' tables. To take it a step further and really make it work for our province, we need rapid testing kits at all schools and essential workplaces because staying at home is a privilege as well as mobile testing and 24 seven vaccine clinics. Since the Ford government has not provided adequate funding for schools with a higher proportion of racialized communities and essential workers, and we know that they have always been disproportionately impacted by poor safety protocols and lower vaccination rates, the ethical decision would be to stop repeatedly ignoring them, pay attention, cover paid sick days, and act now. All essential workers from all sectors of society must be moved into the April priority timeframe. For education workers in particular, if they get their first jabs in April, then they get their second jabs in August before the next school year starts. There must be a proactive response here. Without a doubt, continued inaction and a reactive instead of a proactive approach will lead to more illness and death. The time is now to take politics out of the equation, stop the early campaigning for the 2022 election, and show us that all of our essential workers are truly valued. Thank you. Thank you, Shamila. We'd now like to open the floor to questions from the media. A reminder to media to please include your first and last name and the name of your media outlet in the Q&A section of the Zoom if you'd like to ask a question. Members of the media, please unmute yourselves when you are called upon. And a reminder to the panelists to please unmute yourselves prior to responding. Our first question is from Adrian Gobriel from City News. Go ahead, Adrian. Hi, thank you. Good morning. A uh, uh, question um, for, for, for any of you. Uh, with the teacher unions. It, yesterday, uh, the province sent out a release where they said it's the teachers unions who are stoking fear into the public. I'm hoping you can respond to that. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to, you know, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, we hear this repeatedly um, pointing, you know, trying to point in a different direction, rather this government pointing in a different direction rather than dealing with the issues at hand. Uh, I would suggest to you that what everyone on this, in, during, in this media conference who's spoken today, on behalf of our members and families in this province, uh, we are trying to step up and protect uh, students, and educators, education workers, essential workers in this province. Adrian, do you have a follow-up? I do, uh, perhaps for, for Dr. Furness. Uh, you mentioned uh, the need for, for universal rapid testing. Um, when we reopened schools a second time back in February, uh, the uh, Minister of Education said that the province had the capacity to do 50,000 asymptomatic tests per week. Uh, in the week uh, ending, a five-day period ending uh, most recently on March 23rd, over five school days, they did just 7,000. The province says, listen, these are voluntary. Um, where are we dropping the ball here? What needs to happen to get more students when schools hopefully are open, tested so that we can track, trace, and continue? I guess my answer revolves around the, um, the social determinants of health. When you have an open cattle call, 
for public health, be it for vaccination. And by the way, we're seeing this in, in vaccination patterns. People who have the social capital and the cultural capital and who are connected to the system and who have privilege step forward. Those who are racialized and marginalized typically don't. So the problem, the problem really that we're facing is that when you do an open cattle call, you're going to get some people, but you're not going to get it in a representative way and you're not gonna get the ones that you need to reach the most. So it's not just that the number is lower and too low and that the recruitment has been ineffective, it's dreadfully biased. And that, that takes me right back to the, to the premise that we don't understand transmission in schools and we continue to fail to understand transmission in schools. What we need to do is to do it systematically. Do we force every child to have a test? No, but you, the default should be opt-in. Default should be opt-in and if parents strenuously object, then I think we should be able to accommodate that. But we should be doing something very close to universal testing in the same way that we do other kinds of measures. We, we don't ask kids to volunteer for lice checks in school. We do lice checks. We just, we, we, we check everybody. It's the same idea. So you, if you don't take an equitable universal approach, you're going to find these differentiation in participation based on socioeconomic status. Thank you, Colin. Our next question is from John Chidley Hill from the Canadian Press. John. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I guess this first question would be either for Mr. Hammond or Mr. Bischoff, but it, it could apply to any of the union heads. Uh, my outlet and others are reporting that Premier Ford is going to announce a new stay at home order uh, this afternoon that would be effective tomorrow morning at 12.01 a.m. It's from everything that you guys have said today, it sounds like the unions are not aware of this applying to schools. So aside from Toronto, Peel and Guelph regions, schools will resume after spring break for in-class learning. Is that your understanding? Have you spoken to the government at all about stay at home orders taking effect? Um, so, we certainly have had uh, no communication with the government about uh, about their intentions with regard to schools. I mean, we haven't seen the government itself taking actions. We've seen local public health officers doing that. Um, what I would consider to be an expression of non-confidence in the minister's claim that schools are safe. Um, so once again, there's been a lack of communication. Um, if there is a, a stay-at-home order, um, you know, that could be helpful in supporting schools. If the idea is to, to prioritize keeping schools open, there's ways that that needs to be done. And it's not just by hoping um, that schools will be safe when they're clearly not. But again, an absolute lack of communication from the government. John, do you have a follow-up? Excuse me. Yes, I do. Uh, on the topic of vaccinations in school uh, for teachers and, and other educational staff, would the unions be in support of mobile immunization clinics coming to schools so that staff can be uh, vaccinated like on site rather than having teachers have to sign up like uh, you know, average citizens that are getting vaccinated by age group, would, would that make sense to the unions? Uh, I'll, I'll just very quickly say absolutely. I uh, have no idea why that hasn't happened yet, why the 600 additional nurses that were hired aren't working to implement that. Uh, as Colin said, universal access to testing as well as making sure that however um, we can, those, vac those vaccines, vaccinations are in schools. Why not? Thank you. Our next question is from Melissa Candelaria from Halton News. Melissa? Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you for taking my question. I just wanted to talk about, I mean, um, it's been... It's been very vocal, the situation in schools and the hot spots are Toronto Peel and Halton area um, doesn't get mentioned a whole lot. So I wanted to see if, um, you know, anyone, Liz, Sam, um, Harvey, if you could talk about kind of the situation of how teachers and staff are doing in Halton region. Can you paint us a picture of what they, how they're doing there? Well, I'm. I'm happy to, to address that and certainly based on, on what we have heard uh, from our membership and Harvey and Sam may have, and Anne may have more to add, but I will tell you that when we talk about um, the concern, we're talking about province-wide. 
right? We're talking about, we're hearing from members all across the province who are, are reaching out to us, talking about their experiences in schools, talking about the number of cases they know are in the schools, talking about the fact that, you know, they know of teachers who have been in classrooms where there were, were students who have been identified uh, with COVID-19, and yet that teacher is still expected to report to work because they're considered low risk. So it, it's not um, right now, Toronto and Peel, because those public health units have stepped up, um, have been a huge topic of conversation, but quite frankly, um, you know, absolutely Halton, York Region, there are so many, Ottawa, there are so many hotspots across the province. Um, and we are hearing very clearly from, from teachers there, not only, that their concern for their own safety and that of their students, but also their concerns around the fact that none of this government's robust measures have actually materialized in their buildings. And so how on earth are they supposed to feel safe every day? Could I actually just add on to that um, as well, Liz? I think uh, Liz really talks it is provincial, but I think there's another real key element that often is neglected, um, is that even in situations where public health has chosen to close the schools, those schools are not closed. We have members that continue to report to physical buildings every day. As a matter of fact, in Thunder Bay, uh, we had seven out of eight custodians contract COVID while not a single student was in the school yet they still had the PPE, they still were following all of the precautions. So this idea that schools are closed, everyone is safe at home and, and nothing's going to happen is, oh, um, not truthful. Uh, we have folks, uh, educational assistants, DECEs, clerical folks, custodians, trades that are reporting to those physical buildings every day, even during a shutdown that is deemed by the public health. So um, I think it's time to really start looking at the, there's no measures in place to keep those people safe, even when the students are not there. Melissa, do you have a follow up? Yep. So I just wanted to, to make clear that I know you had mentioned it's a province wide issue, but I just wanted to uh, clear that uh, all of you representative are encouraging the, our Halton Medical Officer of Health to potentially issue this uh, 22 order for schools in Halton to close as well. Uh, I know our numbers is not as high, but they're getting up there. Milton School was closed yesterday, a uh, Catholic school. So just wanted to make it clear that you are also advising our Regional Medical Officer of Health to, to initiate that order as well. I think if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in again. I think specifically what we're expecting is that this government actually finally take responsibility and that it shouldn't actually be falling to public health units. It's actually the responsibility of the provincial government to take care of its provincial citizens. And so I think what we're calling for is that they actually do that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Rudy Chabin from TFO. Rudy. Hello, uh, everyone. Bonjour. Uh, my question is for uh, Anne Vinerwa. Uh, vous demandez la fermeture de, des écoles dans les zones les plus à risque. C'est quoi pour vous la définition des zones les plus à risque? Uh, qu à, à quelle uh, zone vous pensez en dehors de Toronto, Peel et Guelph? Est-ce qu'il faut fermer, par exemple, à Ottawa? Merci pour la question, uh, Rudy. Euh, en effet, il faut se baser sur des chiffres et, et euh, plus particulièrement, vous nommez la région d'Ottawa et c'en est une où les chiffres continuent d'augmenter. Euh, D'autres régions aussi où il faut surveiller de près la courbe pour que s'il y a une augmentation dans le nombre de cas qui se rendent dans les écoles, peu importe d'où ils viennent, si c'est communautaire ou à l'intérieur du système scolaire, il faut absolument agir de façon préventive et arrêter d'attendre que les choses aillent très mal avant de poser des gestes et, et prendre des actions concrètes. 
parce que depuis le début, comme ma collègue Liz vient de le mentionner, le gouvernement abdique ses responsabilités, relance les responsabilités à d'autres institutions, mais vraiment, cette responsabilité-là lui revient, mais euh, c'est jamais, euh, jamais de sa faute si les choses ne fonctionnent pas telles que prévues. Alors oui, il faut surveiller de très près. À ce moment-ci, ce n'est peut-être pas nécessaire que toutes les régions ferment les écoles ou passent en mode virtuel, mais c'est à surveiller de très près et ne pas attendre qu'il soit déjà trop tard, comme c'est le cas dans plusieurs régions présentement. Rudy, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Um, uh, Doug Ford dit que les, les écoles sont sûres. Uh, 99% des enseignants uh, n'ont ne, ne, pas été infectés. Uh, et la contamination vient de la communauté. Comment vous réagissez à ça? Bien, la communauté entre dans les écoles. Les écoles sont dans la communauté. Donc, n'importe quelle forme de transmission est inacceptable pour le milieu scolaire et met à risque tout le monde qui œuvre dans le milieu scolaire. Pas seulement le personnel, mais les élèves et par ricochet, les familles aussi. Alors, le principe de « il n'y en a pas dans les écoles », c'est complètement faux. Si vous regardez les tableaux qui indiquent les cas réels qui ont été décelés et non seulement les quelques-uns qui ont été décelés par l'entremise des tests asymptomatiques, euh, la réalité est tout autre. Là. Monsieur Lecce et Monsieur Ford utilisent mal ou utilisent à leur avantage des statistiques qui sont complètement fausses. Alors, il faut regarder le portrait entier pour déterminer quelle est la réalité du milieu de travail lié à l'éducation. Merci. Thank, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Chris Rochoy from the Toronto Star. Chris. Oh, hi there. Thank you. Uh, my first question is for Colin Furness. Um, you said that we don't have a good understanding of transmission in schools. Is there anything that boards or the province could be doing to get a better handle on transmission in schools? Well, I think the one thing that we could be doing, and it would be an undertaking, no question, is universal testing. That whenever we do sampling, there's going to be some kind of bias one way or the other. Again, we don't know the periodicity of the waves of, of, of transmission in kids in schools, so we don't know when and where to sample. I think a universal approach would actually kill a few birds with one stone. It would let us understand the extent of it, and it would actually let us take preventative steps as well. Chris, do you have a follow-up? Uh, sure. Actually, my follow-up's for Harvey Bischoff. Um, Harvey, you mentioned that schools should be closed in hotspot areas and then teachers be vaccinated and, uh, you know, they not return until the vaccinations take effect. So what did you mean by that? Do you say, you know, one dose and after it kicks in after four weeks? Or are you thinking that teachers need to have both doses before they can return? Yeah, thanks, Chris. And we're um, we're making that recommendation on the advice of an epidemiologist. Um, and so the advice that we've gotten is uh, that after injection, three weeks um, provides significant um, protection um, such that uh, they could return to work at that time. Our next question is from Sne Dugal from Queen's Park Briefing. Hi there, good morning. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, I just wanted to go back to the stay at home order, which we're expecting the government to announce today. Um, I know Mr. Bischoff um, commented on this. I, I just wanted to hear from some of the other um, union leaders that if in fact we do hear this and that schools are remaining open, um, do you support this approach or do you think that um, you know schools should potentially move online during the stay-at-home order? Just, I just want to get your thoughts on that. I think I can answer a bit, Sine. One of the issues that we have with the stay-at-home order is that um, it, it really has created um, a divide a class divide within the education system of those that are able to transfer uh, virtually and those who are unable to transfer virtually. Uh, and typically what we hear is, you know, schools are closed, but we know that uh, the last time, uh, and I shouldn't have to be saying the last time, but the last time that this happened, um, schools, it was a stay-at-home order, uh, yet uh, we had folks in supporting special education students. At this point, we have received no direction from this government what this stay-at-home order means, what it will mean for our students, what it will mean for our staff. Um, you know, and it's unfortunate because this province has never put in place any provincial standards, but then tries to apply provincial measures without providing the backup supports to make it actually work. 
A stay at home order without paid sick leave for all workers isn't going to work if people are going to have to continue to go to work in order to survive by paying the rent, by buying food, et cetera. So a stay at home order alone without other provisions that will actually make it effective um, is really like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. Follow up. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I, regarding the calls for vaccinating education workers during the April break, so we heard a little bit from the Premier yesterday. He mentioned, um, you know, that's an option and the government is working on a plan, but he also said um, that the priority for the government is you know, targeting the most um, or vaccinating the most vulnerable, that includes the elderly, um, those in hot spots. Um, what did you make of his comments and, and did this give you any, um, you know, confidence that we, that you could see kind of a mass rollout of vaccines to education workers during this April break? Uh, thanks for the question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, uh, just very quickly. Um, uh, sorry, Niagara Public Health Unit re uh, just yesterday has opened up their uh, vaccinations to education with some 4,000 education workers in Niagara. That's how easy it is. And you put a plan in place and you get people vaccinated. Um, this government is continually working on a plan and having to go back and talk to people. It's time, as I said in my comments, for them to act. It's really simple. You just open that up to education workers, essential workers, uh, while you are uh, ensuring that, that we're vaccinating uh, those in, in, in the first round who were prior, prioritized in that round and move on as quickly as we can uh, to vaccinate all essential workers. It's simple. Complicated in terms of uh, um, getting it out on the ground, but it's simple in terms of making a decision, acting, and getting it done. Sorry, Ann. No worries. Thanks, Sam. Um, if I may add to that, um, in essence, this news about the government planning or pretending to prioritize essential workers, which teachers and educators are not a part of, <clears throat> could sound like a good idea or a good news, but he's been saying a lot of stuff lately that he's not keeping up to. Uh, what he says should happen on paper looks really good for him, but that's not what happens in, in school-related workplaces. So there's a difference between his theory and his mind and the reality of what people are actually going through in workplaces. So yes, it would be a good news thing if the government is actually going to be doing this vaccination as soon as possible for all essential workers, because he's saying from one side that he supports us and appreciates us, but doesn't do anything concrete to really support that idea. So we need, as Sam has said, as much action as possible and less talk as possible. Um, I just I just want to say that, you know, we have heard repeatedly this morning, it's clear that the provincial government must do more to keep students, education workers and their families, uh, by extension, safe. And we will, everyone on this call will do everything that we can uh, to protect their health and safety. And we call on public health units, trustees and members of the public to join us. Please join us in our advocacy work. And thank you so much to all of the panelists uh, for your participation this morning and to all of you for joining us um, on this key important issue. And we wanna say, you know, we are thinking of all education workers, students and families in this province uh, and, and know that they're looking forward to their well-deserved break next week. Your efforts can continue to be extraordinary uh, and they are so very much appreciated. Thank you.